It's the Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert in Arlington, Virginia. U.S. and global stock markets this week seem to be going crazy. First on Monday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped by 7.3%. Then it bounced back again on Tuesday by nearly 5%. And on Wednesday, it seems to be dropping significantly again. Why is this happening and what does this mean? The main explanations that have been offered about the sudden fall in stock prices has to do with two coinciding events. First, Saudi Arabia's oil price war with Russia and its announcement last weekend to increase oil production by 20% in the next month. This drove down stocks of oil companies and stock indexes more generally. Second, the coronavirus continues to spread throughout most of the world. This has put a serious damper on economic activity as people and businesses hunker down to avoid contracting the virus. Joining me now to discuss the causes and consequences of the stock market's volatility is Richard Wolff. He's Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and visiting professor at the New School University in New York. Most recent book is Understanding Marxism. Thanks for joining us again, Richard. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let's start with the uh, drop in stock markets, and um, stock market prices, and what this actually means. I mean, generally, most people associate a booming stock market with greater economic activity, more wealth, better well-being. First of all, is that true? And is there actually, what is the connection really between the stock market and the general economy? Well, it used to be a bit closer than it is these days. So in general, the answer would be there's some relationship, but it's mediated or it's affected or influenced by many different factors. Recently, for example, the enormous pumping of money into the economy after the crash of 2008 and 9 has made the stock market much more sensitive to what the flow of new money into the economy is pumped in by central banks like the Federal Reserve, then the underlying conditions of the economy so that the relationship is more tenuous, it's more distant, it's more affected by other things. Uh, but in general, there's some relationship between what happens in the stock market on the one hand and what happens in the larger economy on the other. Now, according to Bloomberg News, the new director of the Central European Bank, Christine Lagarde, who until recently I was the head of the International Monetary Fund, actually, she issued a dire warning that the 2008 economic crisis could be repeated if Europe does not act fast enough to, spread, uh, to halt the spread of the coronavirus. Now, would you agree with uh, that, that economic outlook that, this could be, uh, that we could be facing a repeat of 2008? And if so, what's the connection really between the virus and a possible major recession? Right, let me respond first to the question of, of a recession. I think Christine Lagarde is right. She is not alone. A number of leading economic uh, advisory services in New York have informed their clients and in some cases have informed the public that the odds of a recession in the United States have jumped very significantly over the last two weeks compared to what they were before. If you ask me for a consensus, I would now say probably around 50-50 chance. And likewise, that the probability that this downturn could be as severe as 2008, which was thought to be a remote possibility uh, a couple of weeks ago, is now a distinct possibility. So if you're looking for reasons to be frightened, there are plenty of them, and they're being recognized left and right. If I could expand for a moment, the history of capitalism as a system uh, for the last 300 years displays something. Every four to seven years, on average, there's a downturn. Some of them are short and shallow, others of them are long and deep. The 2008 one was the second longest and deepest uh, in the history of capitalism. So we are now 10 years since that time. 10 years is a lot more than the four to seven average. So if you study history, and there's no reason to believe that a pattern that's 300 years old without exception should suddenly have stopped, then we're overdue for one. And it may not be the oil problems that we mentioned or the coronavirus. It really probably didn't matter. Something was going to come along that in another circumstance wouldn't have caused this crisis but with the accumulated imbalances of capitalism that normally produce a downturn, 
Corona and oil were more than enough to push us over that edge. But it's fundamentally the instability of the system that is coming to the fore as we speak. Now, the Federal Reserve actually reacted to the crisis last week by cutting the lead interest rate by 0.5%, which was pretty significant, although it's now very low, around uh, about 1%. So um, that's one measure that has been taken. Now, the Trump administration is also considering several other measures to boost economic activity, such as eliminating the payroll tax, um, uh, withholding tax. Another would be to postpone the tax filing deadline beyond April 15th. So, um, first of all, do you think any of these actions will help? And if they do, who will they help? I think that the actions of the Federal Reserve last week in lowering the interest rate not only didn't stop the contagion and the trouble on the stock market, it actually frightened people to see that kind of a stark action. It was a sign that the problems are probably more severe than we have been led to uh, expect. The Bank of England uh, today also lowered interest rates, so you can see the same panicked reaction uh, there that you saw here, and that panic is at least as infectious as the virus itself. I don't believe the virus by itself explains anything, and I'm deeply suspicious that causing, uh, blaming the cause of the event on the virus is a very convenient way to avoid putting the blame on an economic system that is apparently so fragile, even though we've had the SARS epidemic and the Ebola epidemic before, I'm much more persuaded that the in inherent instability of capitalism, its tendency to have economic crises every few years, building up now over the last 10 years since the last one, is looking for something uh, to deflate the overpriced stocks, and that that's really what we're seeing. I also think that the measures proposed by Donald Trump and others don't seem to understand what's going on, just like their reactions to the virus itself shows that they didn't understand. The Business Insider yesterday, March 10th, carried a table that indicated, for example, that among eight countries, the number of tests of people who have a respiratory problem. In South Korea, it was 3,000 per million of the population. In the United States until March 8th, it was five, not 5,000, not 500, five per million. In other words, the reason we don't have a confirmed virus in our population is not because it isn't there, it's because the country has failed to make the tests. The private sector didn't produce the tax, the private sector didn't distribute the tax, and the so-called government regulation of the sector didn't solve the problem either, thereby risking the health and safety of the United States. This has now become, because of the way the system handles health care as a profit-making enterprise, it has become a danger. Blaming it on the virus is a piece of economic sleight of hand that people shouldn't take seriously. And so the measures taken won't work. Giving people a few more dollars, that's not going to convince them to go to the supermarket when they're afraid to be interactive with other people or to go to the mall or to go to work. These are the kinds of basic issues that have to be dealt with. Only now, under panic conditions, it is the worst kind of mistake to simply throw money at the problem when you have failed to make the structural adjustments that the system and the problem require. Well, um, sticking to that issue, I mean, the structural adjustments, I mean, what would be a better way of dealing with the possibility of a recession in this situation? What do you mean by structural adjustments? Well, there are many things. Uh, perhaps the most important is to fundamentally reorder the economic system. I mean, it used to be that in interviews like this, one hesitates to make that comment because it seems so far-fetched. But we're now in the United States where capitalism is in a very severe problem and where we have more millions of people voting for a socialist than we have had in the past century. So the country is open to the kinds of bigger changes that our problems need, but that used to be somehow a taboo to bring up. So let me start the process going. We ought to have an economic system that doesn't put profit first. 
that ought to put to the, to the fore the things we really care about, like the health and safety of our people. Of course, there should have been tests in the United States. A responsible society would have had those produced. Whether the company makes profit off of it or not is really secondary, because if we're sick and dead, the profit isn't going to help us. The same thing is true in terms of jobs. We know many things that need to be done in the United States. The greening of the country, the environmental protection, the provision of adequate daycare, the provision of adequate elder care for the growing age of our population. To adequately deal with those problems, we could put everybody to work who needs a job and who wants one. The only thing holding us back is that we don't give jobs unless it's profitable for someone to hire you. Putting profit in that position is the problem of why we haven't solved either the coronavirus or the unemployment problem or any of the other issues standing before us. We are capable of doing it. We have the technology, we have the people, and we have the resources. But our economic system puts everything hostage to private profit. And until we deal with that in a concrete way, we are dancing around our issues rather than solving them. And when life and death is at stake, that's a luxury that capitalism is unable to afford us. Well, on that note, we're going to have to leave it there for now. I was speaking to Richard Wolf, visiting professor at the New School University in New York. Thanks again, Richard, for having joined us today. Thank you, Greg. I'm glad to be here. And thank you for joining the Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.